Mayor Harrington, staff counsel to this committee. House Bill 1447 makes changes to provisions related to TANF and other cash assistance programs. The Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF program, is a federally funded program that provides cash assistance to families with children and pregnant individuals to help meet foundational needs. There's also a child-only uh, uh, type of case in which no adult is included in the benefit calculation, and the State Family Assistance program extends TANF benefits under state funding for certain limited populations who are ineligible for TANF. In general, adult TANF recipients must participate in one or more work-first activities, such as employment-based training programs and career development. If a TANF recipient refuses to engage in work-first activities without good cause, the family's grant is reduced and must be terminated after 12 months of continuous noncompliance. Good cause reasons to not participate in work-first include situations where the recipient is a parent or relative caring for an infant or an older child who would need daycare in order for in order for the person to participate and that daycare is unavailable. The TANF laws also um, contained earn, earned income disregard provisions applicable to families who are working, under which in addition to their monthly payment, the family may earn and keep one half of their earnings during every month uh, of TANF eligibility. However, a family may not receive TANF if their income exceeds the maximum earned income level for household size as set by DSHS. Additionally, TANF benefits are generally limited to a cumulative total of five years, though time limit extensions may be offered to families on the basis of hardships, such as severe and chronic disabilities or homelessness. DSHS adopted emergency rules to expand the extension criteria to apply to families experiencing hardships during the pandemic, and this policy was continued in the budget, uh, so any active TANF recipient is currently eligible for a hardship extension through June 30th. The bill makes three changes that apply to just the TANF program. First, the 60-month time limit for TANF benefits is removed as it applies to child-only cases. And in other cases, a family is entitled to receive an extension past the 60-month time limit when termination of assistance would result in financial distress. Second, the earned income disregard applies to 100% of new earnings for up to six months, and the upper threshold for receiving benefits is set at the need standard rather than the maximum earned income level as determined by DSHS. Third, the list of good cause reasons for failure to participate in Work First program components is expanded to include uh, recipients of TANF benefits who are experiencing a hardship as defined in agency rule. The other changes in the bill have to do with cash assistance programs more broadly, so including TANF, um, but also other programs for low-income individuals who don't qualify for TANF, such as recipients of the Age, Blind, or Disabled program, um, or the Pregnant Women Assistance program, among others. In current law, eligibility for cash assistance programs takes into account resources that are owned by or available to a program applicant, through, though uh, some resources are exempt and don't count for purposes of eligibility. Exempt resources include, among other things, um, one motor vehicle with a value of up to $10,000 and all other resources not to exceed $6,000. Under the provisions of the bill, the resource exemptions are expanded to exempt the entire value of one vehicle, retirement funds, pension plans, and retirement accounts, and other resources up to a value of $25,000. The last change relates to the need standard, which is the amount of income required for a household to maintain a minimum and adequate standard of living as determined by DSHS. Current law provides that cash assistance amounts cannot exceed this standard. Under the provisions of the bill, benefits under cash assistance programs must be no less than 15% of the standard of need or the previous year's payment level, whichever is greater, capped at an increase of 3% per fiscal year. And that concludes my prepared comments. Thank you, Mara. Uh, are there questions for staff? Uh, welcome. I have a couple as you come up. Um, Amara, is the earned income disregard, is that basically trying to modulate uh, or modify benefits, Cliff? in your reading of yes yeah, so it's if somebody is gets a job or you know comes into income it would allow the department under under the bill to for six months disregard 100 percent of that in calculating um, a person's income for terms of eligibility under current law it's six months so after the 12 months under the bill it would revert to uh 50 percent or uh after the first six months it would revert to 50 percent Okay, thank you. And then one additional question on the um, retirement and other uh, pension 401k. Uh, is that just having one or is that receiving income from one? So it's 
assets that are available to the person. So right now under rule, um, those are considered resources minus any um, tax penalty that you that you would get for um, taking the money and actually using it. So it would just exempt um, those types of resources from being counted as resources available to the person. Thank you. Additional questions, Representative Goodman. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm surprised that Representative Walsh hasn't asked this question yet. <laughs> Uh, so I'm asking it on his behalf. Uh, it does. Uh, the, the bill provides that uh, after the 60-month time limit, the payments can continue if the individual is in financial distress. Maybe this is a question for staff. How would financial distress, because they're already in financial distress, uh, how would that be defined? Is that by the department? Yes, by the department. Thank you. Additional questions uh, of your own or for another member? <laughs> Seeing none, welcome Representative Peterson. It's going to be a road show. Uh, thank you, Chair Sen, uh, Ranking Member Eslink, uh, Vice Chair um, Cortez. Uh, for the record, Strom Peterson from the 21st District. Um, I was very honored and, and happy to work on this issue as chair of the previous Housing, Human Services, and Veterans Committee for the last couple of years and really started to understand um, some of the issues around these very important programs for the neediest among us. And to me, what it really boiled down to is that over the years, we have made these programs very difficult to access and very easy to be kicked off of. And that seemed to be contrary to something that makes sense to me. We know that families are struggling, and when they're struggling, giving them access to much needed funds is not only the right thing to do, but is the smart thing to do and to get them those funds quickly. I think we had probably the most statistically relevant experiment in this over the last two years with the pandemic, where we were getting money into the hands of families that were really struggling and we saw the effects that they were spending that those dollars on things like food and clothes and books for their kids and things that were important to the safety of their family. Um, I think we need to push back against this idea that is decades old um, thinking that somehow these families are going to not spend the money on those types of things and spend be frivolous and we have to hold them to these almost impossible standards. Because one of the things that they talk about and that this bill addresses is that kind of the hardship. And one of the things that I think we've come to realize, I hope um, in this country and certainly in this legislature, one of the hardest things to do is to be poor. You are constantly worried about how you're gonna feed your kids, how you're gonna get your kids to school, how you're gonna get a second job, all, how are you going to pay your rent? All of those things are incredibly taxing on a family. And to give them a modicum of air to breathe and space to make important decisions is something that we have the ability to do. Is this expensive? Yes. And I understand as a chair of a committee that we have to take these things into consideration. So I think there are a lot of options uh, for you to look at and for us to look at as this bill moves forward. But I think the real cost that we found is when we're not taking care of these families and not giving them that little bit of extra help that will keep them housed and keep their kids fed, the expense to our system is incredibly more than what we might spend here. So with that, um, thank you for your time, and I would be happy to take any questions. Questions? Representative Walsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Rep. Peterson. Um, in my district, some of the proudest people are people who were on TANF and have gotten themselves off, have gotten to a better place, don't need the support as they did at one point. And they are also some of the harshest critics of expanding programs like TANF indefinitely because they feel that the more amorphous the terms of qualifying become, the less likely people are to get off the program. How do you explain to families like that who are proud that they used the benefit as intended, got to a better place, a more stable financial place, and 
now they're taxpayers and they don't want to see these programs expanded indefinitely. How do you explain to them that this is a good thing and, a, and an opportunity cost uh, well uh, averted? Sure. Thank you for that question. And I would love, I would love to have those conversations because that's certainly something that, that, I've, that I've heard from people. Um, broadly, statistically, I think it's been proven that you know, families don't want to be on these programs. They want to do exactly what your constituents did, is get some space, be able to get back on their feet, get a job, get their families whole, and move away. And that's it. The T in TANF is for temporary. But I think one of the things that's happened, not only because of the pandemic, but because of kind of the, the uneven um, progress of our economy is that, that families are struggling more. And part of this is actually really updating some numbers. For example, if you look at the car allowance, we want to make sure that if you are trying to get your kids to school, if you're trying to go to work, you want to have a reliable car. Right now, if your car is worth more than $10,000, you're, you're exempt. $10,000 car nowadays might not be the most reliable thing to get you to work and get your kids to school. So there are some simple things in this bill that are really updating the, ta the, the structure of TANF. So that family that may have been on TANF 10 years ago would kind of look at the, between inflation and cost of living, blah, 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 those economic things, um, that this would make sense. Um, thank you. Representative Eslick. Thank you, Chair Tan, Sen, not Tan. <laughs> So, um, Representative Peterson, uh, is there any place in the bill that requires them to do any financial training or education or job training or any of that? There are still some of the underlying, and so I'm sure there are people behind me that can speak more clearly to this. Um, there are still some of the underlying aspects of TANF, and, and if you're able, I think that's really the question, is sure, if you are I don't want to use able-bodied. If you're able to, to meet some of those requirements, those requirements are still in there. I think what they're finding is that many families, th that those restrictions are too tight, and there are so many families that aren't able to meet those criteria, and so they're not allowed to get on the program or they're kicked off of the program. So some of those criteria are still there. This gives families a, a, and the department a little more flexibility in looking kind of at a case by case basis as to well, who should do that. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, five years. If they're not ready to get off in five years, they're not going to be ready to get off. In my mind, would you say that's true? Um, not necessarily. I think if you look at, um, there might be some significant med medical issues. There might be some significant issues around housing. Um, I, th I think if you're trying to come out of homelessness. That is a very different timeline than if you're, you've just been kind of struggling to, to pay your rent. Like if you've gotten to the point where you are living in your car or living in a tent, the, the delta from that to kind of successful independence to, to Representative Walsh's point is a longer timeline than if we kind of caught you before you got to that point. So I, so I think, again, this gives the department a little more flexibility as to, to how that individual might be able to hit certain timelines. Um, thank you. And in addition, I would just add that it's also a lifetime, uh, 60 months and five years. So you could be on TANF when you're a teen parent and then you are in college and you are on it briefly and then you have kids of your own and you need to be on it. It's a 60 month lifetime. And so if you add all of that, you might have in a different time need a little bit longer than. Um, thank you very much for bringing this bill forward and for being such a good steward of these important human services and disability issues that you have now gently uh, given back to our committee. So we appreciate you, you holding them for a little while and we appreciate you returning them. May not have been quite so gentle. I may have held on. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that they there wasn't the hands, fight. So thank you. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, one additional question from Representative Dent. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree with many of the things you've said, Representative. Uh, I really do. But sometimes I think that maybe we, we put the value of things out there a little too far. 
And, uh, you know, if you're struggling, you're struggling. Uh, I've been there. I remember the poor years of my life when I did work hard and, uh, uh, and I just made things work. And so, you know, I, I would really like to sit down with you if you could, and maybe we could go over some of the details of this and see if we could. If, I, I'm sure you and I have some common ground here. If we could sit down and talk about it. Thank you, Representative Dent. I will take any opportunity as we came in together, um, any opportunity to sit down and have a conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. Representative, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a, a couple panels here today. If I could invite Alex Herr, who I believe is here in person, and have Donna O'Connor and Sin Knight Zayale uh, ready. And on deck, we'll have Melissa Kenny, Liana Cresson, and Alicia Pearson. Welcome, Alex. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Sen, Ranking Member Eslick, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Alex Herr, testifying on behalf of the Statewide Poverty Action Network in support of House Bill 1447. And uh, I'll say it's been a while since I've testified in person in this committee, so it's, uh, I'm happy to be back. Thank you to Representative Peterson for bringing forward this omnibus legislation that combines multiple DSHS agency request bills that did not get included in the governor's budget. Uh, for the purpose of my testimony, I'll focus on section one regarding asset limits. So I had the privilege of working on uh, some previous reform around asset limits and the intent behind that legislation was really to figure out what are um, the metrics that we should be using for how people qualify for public assistance programs. And I think over time, unfortunately, when you put hard limits into statute, it's very hard for it to keep up with changing economic conditions and inflation. And so when we did a modest change, um, I think Representative Dent, you were part of those conversations. I remember having uh, those with you and Representative Clippert in the past. I think the idea back then was, do we force people to spend down all of their savings um, to a very uh, minimal level of cushion before they qualify for help? I think the idea behind programs like TANF isn't necessarily to say, all of a sudden, when you're in abject poverty, the state is stepping up then to replace your entire income. It's a modest cash grant that's, that provides a little bit of support. It certainly doesn't pay for your rent, certainly doesn't pay for all of your food budget and, and transportation needs. So the idea that we um, are proposing in this legislation is to say, perhaps rather than um, spending down all of your safety net, um, especially ones that have tax consequences, especially ones that you're looking for a short-term band-aid, such as what TANF provides, and making really long-term consequential decisions, let's try to meet you somewhere midway. Rather than allowing you to fall into absolute destitute uh, um, uh, situations, let's catch you before you get to that level. Let's stabilize the situation you're going through, and hopefully we can put you back on your feet and actually off of TANF long-term rather than cycling back and forth. We appreciate uh, the consideration by this body. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, and welcome back. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Alex. Good to see you. Um, if we could get Donna O'Connor, who is remote, ready. Donna, when if you can hear us, please go ahead. I can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Sen and members of the committee. My name is Donna O'Connor, and I'm a, uh, the Financial Capability Program Manager at HopeLink. I'm also a financial coach and a financial counselor. I'm here today to testify in support of House Bill 1447. There are many positive provisions of this bill, but today I would like to focus on the changes to reduce the catastrophic impacts of the benefits cliff, which is the abrupt reduction or loss of benefits when household earnings increase. Allowing a household to keep its increased earnings for six months without negative impact to the reward will provide much needed time for the household to stabilize with their new earnings and focus on progress toward lasting financial security. This could mean things as simple as establishing an emergency fund. It could mean paying down some medical bills. It could mean paying off high interest debt so that a greater portion of income can then go to pay for basic needs and even accessing safe, affordable credit building and banking products so that they can fully participate in traditional banking and financial systems rather than alternative options that are costly and often predatory. I'd like to share firsthand an experience I had with one of my clients just last week. We spent an hour together trying to na navigate this very issue. She has, a, she has a comprehensive spreadsheet all set up. She has her monthly income, benefits, expenses, everything is all ready to go. She even has hyperlinks to know what the income and resource limits are so she can plan for her new job and navigate the immediate impact of lost benefits. 
This exercise was not just an exercise on numbers, but it was also an incredibly stressful and nearly paralyzing experience for her. She was fearful of taking the next step. In my role as the uh, chair of the Washington Financial Coaches Network, I also hear this from coaches all across the state. It is imperative that families have time to adjust and build a foundation for long-term stability with their new income and not be penalized for achieving the goal of work. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much, and thank you for providing fabulous services in my community. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sinai Zahile, if you're in, please go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Sen, Vice Chairs Taylor and Cortez, and members of the committee. My name is Sanait Zahlai, and I'm testifying on behalf of Northwest Harvest today in support of House Bill 1447. As someone who has previously, who has personally experienced the challenges of trying to make ends meet, I understand the importance of having access to supportive programs like TANF. This bill takes important steps to improve the program, including allowing families to build up savings by increasing asset limits and waiving the value of a car. In order to ensure families have the stability they need, it is imperative that we permanently allow hardship as a time limit exemption and remove the time limit for child only cases. I am passionate about making sure families can stabilize without losing their benefits, which is why stabilization waivers are tremendously helpful in allowing hardship as a good cause for exemption from workforce requirements. As our public benefits specialist, I work with ind individuals every day who rely on assistance programs like TANF for their daily living. This, the fixes on this bill will be transformative and positively impact the lives of families who are struggling. It will provide them with the resources and stability they need to get back on their feet and build a better future for themselves and for their families. For these reasons and many more, I strongly urge your support on House Bill 1447. I thank you for allowing me this time and considering my testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we'll have Melissa Kenny, who I believe is here in person. And if we can have Liana Cresson and Kevin Riscare ready and on deck, we'll have Jude Ath Ahmed and Jose de la Peña. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Sen and committee members. My name is Melissa Kenny. I am the TANF Workforce Administrator um, within the Administrative Services Administration. Oh, Economic Services Administration with the Community Services Division. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, I do want to draw your attention to that our department has submitted a letter with some suggestions for this bill. Um, otherwise, I am signed in as other. Happy to take any questions you have, answer them the best I can. And um, otherwise, that's the extent of my testimony today. So thank you. Uh, questions, uh, Representative Couture. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are you worried about just the way this bill is written right now that it could explode the caseload, especially considering it's not, this additional caseload's not funded in the governor's budget and then falling short of, you know, the required funding to handle that caseload, what that could mean for you? Um, so our department is currently working on the fiscal note and doing that analysis to support information available on this bill. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, we're looking at that data, we're figuring out what the impact to caseload would be, um, and we're happy to provide more details once the fiscal note is out. So thank you. Uh, and just follow up on that, some of this is in the governor's budget. Um, the time limit extension policy, there are some provisions in the governor's budget to extend the time limit extension policy that currently is in effect through June of 2025, and there is funding for that. So there is kind of some overlap with this bill and then the provisions that are in the governor's budget currently. So, Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next, if we can have Liana Cresson, who is remote. Liana, if you can hear us, please go ahead. Hi, Chair Sen and members of the committee. My name is Liana Cresson here with Property Action Network and very strong support of House Bill 1447. My thanks to Representative Peterson for sponsoring this bill and to your committee for hearing it. Programs like TANF should be made to fit people instead of forcing people to fit into programs. 
We should have a safety net that promotes equity, catches you when you're in need, and understands life's complications like a car breaking down, a difficult diagnosis, or a sudden loss. For the purposes of my testimony, I want to highlight two important things that this bill does. First, this bill introduces stabilization waivers, allowing hardship to be considered good cause for not being able to completely fulfill participation requirements, giving families time to find their footing instead of punishing them for falling short. A recently released DSHS report found that Indigenous and multiracial families are more likely to have their benefits reduced, terminated, or denied due to sanctions. This risk for Indigenous families was 67% higher than the risk for all clients. This policy aims to address this disproportionality by allowing trust to be built and giving the department the freedom they need to meet people where they're at and adjust their responsibility plans so that they can be successful to be able to offer support instead of punishment. Secondly, House Bill 1447 would finally restore the pre-2011 policy of allowing families to access help when they still need it past their 60-month lifetime limit. The hard cutoffs and rigid exemption categories have led to Black and Indigenous families being cut off at much higher rates than their percentage of the caseload. The same holds true for Latino families within child-only TANF cases. The fix this bill would codify is currently in effect thanks to changes made in the budget since 2020. However, these are not secure, and if money's not put in the budget, we go back to a bad policy with racist outcomes. And in the words of DSHS, ultimately, the pandemic response has showed that the simplest and most complete solution, that this is the most complete solution to this disproportionality. Thanks, Leanna. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. All right, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Kevin Briscore, if you are on and can hear us, please go ahead. I'm not seeing Kevin on here at this time. Oh. Um, Maybe. Oh, I think he's we could, joining us right now. Okay, we could move to Jude Ahmed and Jose de la Peña if either of you are on. Jude? Hello, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jude Ahmed. I'm an advocacy organizer at the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, serving Black and other vulnerable communities. I'll actually be reading a testimony from one of our community members, Letitia Black, who is not available for this hearing, but wanted to testify pro. My name is Letitia. I'm a single mother of one and a former TANF recipient. I found myself working a dead end minimum wage paying job. I realized the best option for me to elevate in my life was for me to return to school and obtain my college degree. There was just one problem. How would I provide for myself and my then five-year-old daughter? I decided to seek support from the Department of Social and Health Services and chose to participate in the TANF program. The TANF program assisted me with a monthly cash grant, which was great as it helped me to obtain basic necessities for my daughter and I. I began attending college and participating in the work-study program offered at my school. Childcare was also a major need for me to be successful during my educational journey. Since I was meeting all of the TANF program requirements, I was eligible to receive childcare financial assistance so that my daughter could attend. I was also eligible for a program within my school which extended additional financial and support services to TANF recipients. I am grateful that I was able to find stability within the current time limits of TANF, but life always comes with unexpected challenges. If I would have had any hardships or setbacks emerge, as they do for many others, it would not have been enough. I would have lost the financial and additional support I received at school because I could only receive those while I was on TANF. I earned my bachelor's degree in youth development and became a licensed substance use disorder professional. I'm now working within a school district supporting families meeting their basic needs. I'm grateful for community programs like TANF because they create an opportunity for families living on low incomes to thrive in life and reach self-sufficiently. This is a worthwhile program to continue improving. Thank you for this time during testimony and I hope you please consider um, the words of Letitia. Thank you. Thank you, dude and Letitia. Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next, we have Jose. Jose, if you're on and can hear us, please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Chair San and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify pro on House Bill 1447. My name is Jose De La Pena, and I am an employee of the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. We are a Seattle-based nonprofit serving Black and other vulnerable communities in King County through wraparound services and health access, housing, financial empowerment, career development, and so much more. The main reason that I want to talk more about this bill is the asset limits that are currently on deck. Um, 
there is currently a limit of 6,000 um, compared to our new limit of 25,000. There's so much that could happen um, to uh, a citizen um, that six, holding on to assets of less than 6,000 um, is not uh, feasible for some people because um, if uh, that 25,000 um, is reached, um, it would not be, um, people would not be able to uh, uh, stockpile their resources for more than a couple months. And so I urge you um, to be able to pass this bill. Um, in the name TANF, it is temporary. Um, there are many stories of people who have become successful due to programs like this. And there is a cost, but definitely the cost of human potential is, is something that we cannot ignore. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, and I believe Kevin has uh, joined us. Kevin, if you can hear us, please go ahead. <laughs> Kevin, can you hear us? Looks like Kevin is on, but he is still muted and his video is off. Representative Cortez. Um... Kevin, if, if you can hear us, you're muted. We'd love for you to unmute and testify. Hello? There are, yep, we can hear you, Kevin. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for the uh, mishap there. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Sin and members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Kevin Brisker, right? I live in Kent or Beer in Washington, and I support uh, the House Bill 1477, uh, 1447. Um, asking for help is very difficult as a father, as a man. And then when you're offered help by the state, it should be something that actually works out for us instead of something that keeps us down and something that uh, is not really helping us. Um, and I know what it feels like when I get real help. And I also know what it feels like when I'm not getting real help and somebody's, you know, putting their foot in my neck. So um, as a single father, I'm, you know, I use the TANF to help, you know, to meet most of my basic needs while I, and I'm very happy, happy about the, uh, you know, the support that I get from TANF for my family, but it's not enough. Um, and it's like a whole much more that, you know, that can be done. And I heard the gentleman speaking earlier and he was saying, oh, it's just like a, a small stippling, you know, and it's not to, to be lived off. But what you don't understand, the small stippling, people are living off of this small stifling. So it might not be meant for that, but that's just what's going on. We're getting by with just these crumbs. So um, that part is definitely real. And then um, and, and the families that need the help, they should be able to get the help regardless how long or how the, uh, the program is. And when they need the help, they need to get the help when they're asking for it instead of a runaround or getting treated like you're less than human because you don't have the financial situations to, you know, to, to, to maintain yourself and your family. And then um, the amount of ten of that is that you guys do allow out there is doesn't keep up with the, the, the rate of living out here, you know. Um, so it, it, it's a couple other things, too. But. And uh, this this winter, I had my uh, my financial situation. Um, my money was stolen from me from my tantrum. And the situation is that I went to them. I let them know that, hey, somebody took my money and they just treated me like, you know, um, I was just another number. It was doing Christmas. I didn't have Christmas for my kids. No lights for, you know, couldn't pay electricity. Um, I'm still trying to, I'm really from that. I'm still trying to catch up financially from that situation. But my whole thing is if TANF is giving out, and you guys know that these people are that you're supposed to give this tenor to the uh, the families who's not receiving it, they're not getting it, and somebody's stealing it. And instead of you guys saying, "Oh, well, that's not our problem," you know, you guys need to go ahead and um, replace that money because the families that you intended to get it did not get that money. Now, if you guys' system is broken, cracked, you guys need to fix that system. But do not make us people who's already down in the dumps, you know, pay for the, um, the situation because somebody's cracking you guys' system. We're, I'm already hurt. I'm already down. I'm already on tandem. Now somebody stole my money and you guys' system and you guys' solution is, hey, well, we can't do nothing about it. A lot, it's happened to a lot of people. Oh, well, it's got to be better than that. It's got to be better than that. 
And like I said, I'm one of the persons out here living with my sleeves rolled up every day out here. I'm not like living off the books. I'm not telling you guys some statistics. I'm not sitting back in a high chair looking down on everybody. I'm out here in it. And it's real rough. And it's not no joke out here. And we all need some help. Thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing Thank um, you. your reality. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. There are no more testifiers, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Seeing no more testifiers, we'll close the hearing.